I welcome everybody this morning to the first of a three-part series called King. I'm telling you, I'm incredibly excited about this series. I believe that it's going to bring some true uh, solidarity to our faith in the next three weeks. So if you would, just invite out uh, for this series, for this time and season. I believe that people are more receptive now than ever before uh, to come into God's house. So remember to invite this next coming week. Next week, we're going to be talking about the King undersold, already getting excited about what God's going to do in this place. But this morning, you know, we begin to celebrate the season, the season of the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only Savior, but for many of us, King. The King who was, is, and is to come. You know, we do ourselves and our faith a disservice when we try to tie Jesus to simply one time frame. For Jesus always was, and he always will be. Revelation 1.8 says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who still is to come, the Almighty One. Church, if our faith is tied just to one moment in time, then I believe it would be possible for another moment in time to take away our faith, if not at least diminish our faith. But if our faith is thread through the one who was, is, and is to come, then we are held together by eternity. Today I want to speak a little bit about the king foretold. The king foretold. Father, today I pray that you would anoint your servant as he speaks your word, may speak nothing more, nothing less, only what you would have him to speak today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I think it's important for us, even foundational, I'll say, as believers, for us to know that Jesus is more than just a moment in time. Jesus is more than just the cross or just the resurrection. The word of God tells us that he is the beginning and he is the end, the alpha and the omega, that he always was always will be, and he is the one to come. As we walk through this series, we're going to see that Jesus is the king foretold, the king undersold, and ultimately he will be the king to behold. This progression is important and will bring solidarity to our faith in times that are certainly unstable. There's so much, I believe, trying to erode the foundation of our faith. We live in an unstable cultural climate right now. Would you agree with that? That what I'm saying this morning is not the foundational truth of many. Even many who would claim to be believers would not say that a lot of what I'm talking about this morning would be a foundational truth for them. So I want to begin to unpack the story that always was and always will be today. And it's a little different Christmas story because it goes back before the Christmas story ever was. So what am I talking about today? I'm talking about prophecy. Prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, it is to predict with assurance, to speak as divinely inspired. I like this definition, one in which you won't find in a book, but I like it. It says, a picture of what is to come. A picture of what is to come. Prophecy. Jesus was the king foretold. Church, fulfilled prophecy is power. Fulfilled prophecy is power, and oftentimes we don't give prophecy its, pow- uh, its proper place. We, we mention it briefly in passing, but yet we don't really think about the weight that it has. When something is fulfilled, it makes it reality. Fulfilled means to bring to completion or reality, to achieve, to realize something desired, promised, or predicted. So get this. I want you to really wrap your minds around this. There are around 400 references, prophecies, appearances, or foreshadowings of Jesus in the Old Testament, the Old Testament. 
the part of the Bible written before the birth of Jesus. This is important for our faith because if we don't have this solid foundation, then we have nothing to look back to. Our faith is simply tied to a moment in time. And for those of you this morning who you've been sitting in church your whole life and you know that the Old Testament is before the birth of Jesus, can I, can I urge you to not take your faith for granted and don't take your knowledge for granted? Because some of us, it's like, oh yeah, we, we know this stuff. We grew up with this, we get it. The Old Testament is the big part of the Bible that we don't read as much and it's before the birth of Jesus. And the New Testament is the part we really like about Jesus. But can I tell you that the Old Testament will bring solidarity to the New Testament. That they all work together from beginning to the end. Are you with me? And I, I'm just so simple to believe that Jesus is what it's all about. From Genesis to Revelation, it, it all tells us of the king foretold. So, I want to uh, read something today that CBN wrote, and I just wanted to go ahead and share it word for word because I felt it was that good. There was nothing I could really add to it or jazz it up. And just so you know, you can probably tell already, this is not a jazzy message. You're probably not going to be standing up, waving hankies at me this morning, or shouting me down. But I believe it is vitally important for us to have messages like this in the file of our faith. Because if we do not, when the shouts fade, we have nothing to hold us. If not, then when times get hard and feelings dissipate, it's harder to stand our ground. The article said this, down throughout history, God provided us a roadmap. He foretold various signs and conditions through his prophets. These prophets spoke of things that mankind should watch for so that the Messiah would be recognized and believed. These signs or prophecies were given to us through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the part of the Bible written before Jesus was born. Its writings were complete in 450 B.C. The Old Testament, written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus contain over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. I know I said 400 earlier, but 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled through his life, death, and resurrection. Mathematically speaking, you'll be happy to know that I did not do these statistics. My one joke for the day. The odds of anyone fulfilling this amount of prophecy are staggering. Mathematicians put it this way. One person fulfilling eight prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. We'll leave that there for a second. One person fulfilling eight prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. One person fulfilling 48 prophecies one chance in 10 to the 157th power. That is so much I don't even understand. I mean, if it was me and I was the mathematician on this board, I would have said something like to infinity and beyond. Okay, that's what it means. But just to go a step further, one person fulfilling 300 plus prophecies, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Amen? It is that magnificent detail of the prophecies that mark the Bible as the inspired Word of God. Only God could foreknow and accomplish all that was written about Christ. This historical accuracy and reliability sets the Bible apart from any other book or record. With this in mind, I want to do something else different today. I want to read for you a section of scripture in Isaiah chapter 53. Keep in mind, this part of the Bible was written 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Are you with me? 400 years before Christ came as a baby in 
a manger. And I want to ask you to take it one step further and just, if you would close your eyes with me, this might be uncomfortable for some of you, and that's okay. Try not to fall asleep during this process. And I'm going to read Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. And I just want to urge you to take your mind there with me. This is before the birth of Jesus. And just listen to the words. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. And there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, and he was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people, and he had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, and he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Verse 11 says, when he sees all that he has accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he has exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. If you would open your eyes with me. That scripture was written 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Church, those sins that he bore were yours and mine. Those sins that he bore were yours and they were mine, and he told us of them and took them before they were ever committed. You, you want to talk about bringing some solidarity to your faith. He spoke of your sins, and he took your sins before they were ever committed. I want to share with you just four, four out of the 300 prophecies that were fulfilled, just out of this text alone. The first one, he was silent before his accusers. He was silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53, 7 through 8 says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. This is before the birth of Jesus. Now listen to after the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, what Matthew says in 27, 12 through 14. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges that they're bringing against you, Pilate demanded? But Jesus made no response to any of these charges, much to the governor's surprise. Any man in his right mind would have spoke up in this moment and said, you need to let me go. I've done nothing wrong. But as a sheep is silent before its shears, so would the Son of Man be as well. I want to let you know that Jesus is real. For those who may be skeptics this morning, 
I, I want to just speak to you beyond faith for a moment and let you know the historical context of Jesus. Jesus is a factual individual, a factual character. Are you with me? This is not just the Bible that speaks of Jesus, but all religions speak of Jesus as a human being who walked this earth. Whether you believe him to be the son of God or Messiah or any of that, know this, Jesus is real. And to claim that he is not is you are deeming yourself insane. It is as if you are saying George Washington did not exist or that my grandfather did not exist. It's the same, are you with me? That is not to degrade you in any way, but I'm just telling you factual evidence in history. Whether you believe him to be the son of God or not, no man or woman in their right mind can say Jesus isn't real because Jesus most certainly walked this earth, whether he is your king or not. Historical documents declare even his works. I think it's important to note that before we go further. Second prophecy, he was beaten so we could be whole. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins, not his own. He was beaten so we could be whole and he was whipped so that we could be healed before the birth of Jesus. Now written after the birth, life, death, burial, resurrection. John 19, 1, 3 says, then Pilate, had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a purple robe on him and they prophesied themselves. They didn't even know it. And they said, hail, king of the Jews. They mocked. And they slapped him across the face. He was beaten, church so we could be whole. The third prophecy, he was killed like a criminal. Isaiah 53, nine says, he had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave before the birth of Jesus, prophecy. After the birth, Life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, Mark 15, 27. Two revolutionaries, some translations say criminals, were crucified with him. This is the way in which they killed criminals. One on his right and one on his left. He was killed like a criminal. The details of prophecy, can I tell you that the details of prophecy only add to the validity of Jesus. They should only strengthen our faith. And I want to tell you that when I was preparing this message, as different as it is, I was strengthened like none other. Because I realized that they spoke of Jesus, although I knew it, when I really knew it again. You know what I'm saying? Like you know something, but then you know it. It strengthens your faith. And I had just this feeling this week of it doesn't really matter what happens in my life, it doesn't really matter what comes against me. Because I know this, I will stand on a firm foundation for the rest of my life, regardless of my loss or my gain. Because my faith is not tied to a, a single moment of Jesus, but it is tied to the eternity of Jesus. I, I cannot base my life upon one situation or struggle or circumstance. I base my life upon the one who was and is and is to come. And because of that, I can be solid in the midst of any situation. A firm foundation, regardless of what trembles my faith. The fourth the prophecy fulfilled, he died for the sins of everyone. Everyone in this room. Everyone who was before and everyone who ever will be, he died for the sins of everyone. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Let's check out a few scriptures here after the birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Acts 10. Also note, 
written by a couple different authors, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Acts 10, 43. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Ephesians 1, verse 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. 1 Peter 2, 24, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. I want you to think about this. If Jesus isn't real, meaning he isn't Messiah, we've already, we've already proclaimed this morning that he is a person. He was a person who walked this earth. He is real. But if he isn't real, meaning what he said he was going to do and who he said he was, which I will give my life to say that he is, then the most elaborate plan in all of history was pulled off. Think of this. The Old Testament was written. Hundreds of years later, someone comes on the scene and says, you know what? I want to fulfill all that was written in that book. So to make that happen, I have to convince 12 men to follow me around the region of the world. Then I have to convince thousands of people that I am who I say I am. Not only that, but I have to word for word do all that was said I would do. I hope you're catching this. And I have to convince different theologians and writers to write the same thing about me. Come on, somebody. And get them all on the same page to write the same thing and then to keep it the biggest secret of all time and never let anybody know that it was false. Are you with me? Most of us this morning believe it's true, but there are those who claim it to be false. I heard it actually said this week as I was doing some reading. Someone made this statement, and this was supposedly an intelligent person. They said, well, Maybe, maybe he had all that wrote about him just to make himself the Messiah. That, to me, is one of the greatest miracles of history. I mean, if Jesus isn't who he says he was, and he just, once again, did all this as an elaborate hoax, are you with me? He's the most intelligent human being that ever lived. I think I'd still follow that guy. I mean, I mean, what a genius he is. Either Jesus was absolutely insane and convinced millions of people to be insane with him, or he is the truth. We're not talking about some kooky cult leader that convinced hundreds or maybe even a couple thousands to follow. We're talking about millions throughout time and history. Something else, and not in a controlling fashion. <laughs> I follow him because I'm free. I follow him because he gave me the opportunity to walk with him, to give me a new heart to see humanity as he sees them, to not be controlling or condemning in my nature, but to be more like him. So I don't follow him because I'm controlled by a madman. I follow him because I've been set free by a king. A king, a king who was foretold not a king who just showed up on the scene and said, I'm here. But a king who wise men throughout time and history said, there will be one to come. He is the one who was. He is the one who is. He is the one to come. Church, prophecy fulfilled gives us a present hope. Prophecy fulfilled 
gives us a present hope. And I have a present hope this morning. I have a present hope that no matter what comes in this life, there will be a life to come because he told me of it. And because he told me of so many other things and it came to pass, I just happened to believe what he said. That there will be a heaven where all pain will pass away. There will be a place where I will go and I will see the one face to face who I follow by faith now, but I will see by my eyes then. He is the king foretold, the king who was, my king who is, and he is the king that will come to behold. You know, there are times when looking to past gives us hope for our present and our future. If you can't hear his voice this morning, look to the past and see that it's true. If you can't feel his presence this morning, look to the past and see the prophecy fulfilled and allow it to strengthen your heart this morning. It was foretold what Jesus would do and he fulfilled it. Once again, you can take it or leave it, believe it or don't. If he isn't real, if it isn't true, then man, he's one of the greatest geniuses of all time. But I just so happen to believe it to be true. Not only historically, the factual evidence and prophecies fulfilled, but I know my heart. I know the exchange that has been made. I know that my mind doesn't think the way it wants sometimes because he's, he's calling me to think different. You see, I, I, I can't just believe the lies that the world will tell me because there's a different nature inside of me and he's working within. I pray that you feel it. I pray that you know it. I pray that it brings some solidarity to your faith, knowing prophecy fulfilled. So I have two questions today as you stand to your feet. Two very simple questions, for I think that faith comes down to simple things. First question is, will you place your trust in the king foretold? Will you place your trust in the king foretold? Maybe you haven't. Oh, can I, can I just tell you, he's done so much for you. Can I just tell you that there are over 300 prophecies fulfilled so that he could get to you. Can I just tell you that they, they, they mocked him and they beat him, and they spat upon him and they pierced his hands and his feet. And they placed a crown of thorns on his head and he went through so much anguish and suffering for you. Will you place your trust in him? And as a believer, is your faith strengthened by the fulfillment of things spoken in times past? I hope, I hope it is. Mine certainly is. Mine certainly is. If I know nothing else throughout the rest of my life, if I find no new things, no new knowledge to understand, no new wisdom to gain, I have gained enough to keep me, to keep me in faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today, I want to pray a prayer. I wanna invite you to pray with me. Maybe you've never started on that journey of faith, that pathway of faith. I wanna pray right now and invite you to pray with me. For the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved, born again. You're gonna be made new. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you or what you've done or the wrongs you feel like you've committed, you will be cleansed, the Bible says. Cleansed, made new on a, a path and journey of faith where you're becoming renewed all the time. If you want to begin that journey of faith, pray with me today. You'll be cleansed of your sins, you'll be made new in this place. Pray with me. Church, would you help me? Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I need you. 
I know that I have sin in my life, but I know that you took my sin. I, I give it to you. Cleanse me of it. Make me new. I believe that you're real. I believe you're my savior. I believe you're my king and I will follow you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can I tell you today, can I tell you today that there's nothing that anyone can do to take that away from you. There's nothing anyone can say to break the faith that you've placed, your trust that you've placed in Jesus Christ this morning. Monday morning can't take it away from you. Hold it tightly in your heart. Guard it even, the Bible says, because there will certainly be times and there'll be things that will try to pry at your faith. Believer, how, how, how many know that to be true? Things that will pry at our faith, we, 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 things we'll, we'll question, things we'll, we'll ask, why? Hold tightly to the faith that you've planted in Jesus. And believer, today, I pray that you've been strengthened. I pray that you will leave this place, feeling or not, Say, he's my king. He is my king. He is my king. How many feel like you've been in God's house today? I, I pray that you have. I want to take this opportunity just to, to share with you about next week briefly. Listen, next week is going to be awesome. We're going to be talking about the king undersold. It's going to be a totally different style of message. And I believe that if there's going to be a week, you're going to invite someone. Invite them next week. Get them in this place. Listen, because people know we're here, they need to be brought. People know we exist, but they're not just going to come, many, without an invite to come and hear what God wants to do in their life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all honor. We give you all glory today. You are so worthy to be praised, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord God, that your spirit would lead God and direct us, Lord, this week. Open up doors of opportunity to share who you are to others. I pray, God, you'd give us boldness to invite people in your house to experience your goodness, to experience your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for being here with us today in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, we'll see you back here next week.